In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, again, it is great uh, to see you, and I think we're streaming right now, so if anybody happens to be watching, great to see you uh, as well, or great to be seen by you anyway. Man, what a year, huh? What a year, 2020. Uh, and it's, it's not quite halfway through. I mean, that, that's kind of, somebody said this morning, thanks a lot for reminding us of that. We do have an election to look forward to, so, um, you know, get your popcorn ready. Uh, for that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, uh, there have been a lot of memes, uh, sort of uh, computer uh, pictures that, uh, just humorous pictures about about 2020. One said, uh, y'all, the most normal part of this year has been the Tiger King. So, um, <laughs> it may be true. Um, and so, uh, there's been a bunch that have said, um, these, are my, these were my plans, and this has been 2020. So, one said, my plans had a picture of a beauty queen receiving her crown, right? And 2020 had a picture of a zombie with crazy eyes, you know? That's, one had a picture of uh, the Titanic, my plans, and 2020, iceberg, you know? So, um, you know, humor like that is a great way to cope because this has been just a crazy, weird, hard year so far, and, and, it's, and we're still going. And so last week I said that we're going to take a look at the Psalms for a little while. Because the Psalms express uh, every emotion that we have before God. The Psalms yell at God and they, they express sorrow and they praise God and they hold relentlessly on to faith in God and God's sovereignty when the world around them seems to crumble. And so I need humor, and I need friends, and I need exercise, but I really need for God Almighty to speak through the Scriptures to my heart, to know that He knows what I know. And Psalm 100 um, says, if you look in, in your Bible, you know, a lot of times in the Psalms, when you look in your Bible, they have a little header. Um, we don't usually print that in the, in the bulletin, but in the little header, it might say a psalm of David or a psalm for the choir or something like this. This one says, a psalm for giving thanks. And it's the only psalm in all 150 psalms uh, that's, that designates itself as a psalm for giving thanks. And this made me think about a passage from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, not the passage that Sharon just read, but um, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in all circumstances, give thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances. And it's hard to give thanks in all circumstances. I mean, I don't know what your outlook is right now, but I don't mind telling you that the zombies and the icebergs uh, make it hard to give thanks sometimes for me. What a comfort that 1 Thessalonians 5 does not say give thanks for all circumstances, but give thanks in all circumstances. In the midst of all that's going on around you, you can give thanks. And Psalm, that, that may seem, uh, that may great when we're going through a, a difficult time, but Psalm 100 tells us how. And I need that. So Psalm 100 begins with, um, lots of commands to be joyful. And that can be sort of hard to hear when we're feeling down, we're feeling uh, defeated uh, by the world. It, it's sort of like, I mean, I have these incredible, three incredible kids, right? But every now and then there's this off day where, where they might be feeling grumpy or have a bad attitude, and I might say, you need to adjust your attitude. And let me tell you, that is good advice. But I have yet to have one of them respond by saying, you know what, Dad, you are right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That is, uh, thanks for straightening me out, Dad. I needed to hear that today, right? Because, or when I have a bad attitude and Amy says, you need to adjust your attitude. I don't, I don't say yes, dear. (laughs) um, When we hear the command to be joyful and we're not joyful, it can, it can feel like that. And Psalm 100 says, be joyful in the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
as long as you're wearing a mask. Know that the Lord is God. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Give thanks to him. Call upon his name. Let me tell you, that is a lot of good advice. A lot of good advice. And if it ended right there, Psalm 100 would be a great psalm to use during happy times, right? Because it's, it would always be good advice, but, uh, and because we, we should always serve the Lord with gladness, but it would sort of fall on deaf ears when we're going uh, through times like this, right? I mean, unless we're doing great, stock market's up and the kids are healthy and you know, we're allowed to have people over for dinner, <laughs> shake their hands, we feel safe going out of our homes. In those times, be joyful in the Lord, no problem. But without the last verse, a psalm, uh, this psalm would fall a little flat in times like we're in now. Feel, it'd feel a little distant. It's the last verse that makes this a psalm for right now. Because the last verse tells us about the character of God. The world around us is shifting sand. And Psalm 100 gives us truths about God that we can stand on. And, and so that truly, in all circumstances, we can give thanks. From the place of health and happiness and the five-star performance review, or from the coronavirus ICU, from the unemployment office, from the place of weeping, at unexpected loss, we can give thanks in all circumstances because of who God is. Now, this last verse begins with a very important word, small little word, four, three, three letters, F-O-R. And what it means in the Bible when it's used like this is that, that you, can, you can trust everything I just said is true because of what I'm about to tell you. And the psalmist is telling us that the reason that we can be joyful and the reason that we can give thanks is because of what he's about to tell us about God. So three things he tells us, very quick. Number one, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Now, Normally, when I teach about uh, the goodness of God, I will say that, that God is good because he is God that he himself is the author and the definition of what good is, that he himself does not submit to a standard of goodness outside of himself because he is the standard. And that is true. But I think the psalmist actually has something else in mind. I think the psalmist is saying the Lord is pleasing to the psalmist. Like when I say that someone is a good person. I'm saying that that is a person who can be trusted, uh, whose morals, whose character, whose demeanor uh, are pleasant and attractive. It's the kind of person that I want to be around. They're a good person. And I think the psalmist, when he says the Lord is good, he's saying that he really likes God. That God can be trusted to abide and to provide and to bless and to forgive and to redeem. I think the psalmist is reminding us that no matter what is going on around us, the Lord is our refuge and our strength. The Lord who allows the suffering in and around our lives is also the one who gives us the strength to get through it and the one who redeems it. Remember Jesus said, not a sparrow falls apart from the eye of the Father, and you are of much more value than a sparrow to the Father. The Lord is good. And next the psalmist tells us that God's mercy is everlasting. Maybe this was the uh, biblical phrase that Archbishop Cranmer had in mind when, uh, centuries ago when he wrote the prayer that declares that God's property is always to have mercy. Write one. I don't usually do that at this service. 
But his property is always to have mercy. His bent towards his people is and always has been mercy. And it's all throughout both Testaments. Don't let anybody tell you that the God of the Old Testament is this angry God and the God of the New Testament is this loving God. Like he's all, all throughout the Old Testament, the, the authors of Scripture call him merciful. His steadfast love endures forever. His desire is not to punish. In fact, do you remember the Ark of the Covenant? There's a place where, uh, up on top of the Ark of the Covenant, where God was said to sit and judge his people from inside the table, the, inside the temple. Remember what it's called? The mercy seat. God's place of judgment is mercy. The mercy seat. He is merciful. And the psalmist says his, his mercy is everlasting. That word in Hebrew is a word that looks forward and backwards at the same time. It means antiquity and the future. He is not going to be merciful in one moment and sneak up and get you the next. God does use the suffering or hard things in our lives to sand off the rough edges or to humble us or to correct us, draw us into a more intimate relationship with him. But all the punishment, you never need to worry, am I being punished by God? All the punishment for our sin has already been poured out on Jesus on the cross, and that grace is never taken away so that we can now rest assured that Jesus is never not merciful. God's mercy is everlasting. And finally, his faithfulness endures from age to age. I mean, you know that the world is changing right before our eyes. Health protocols are changing. Racial relationships are changing. Church is changing. Politics are changing. Education is changing. Sports is changing. Change it. Don't change our sports. I mean, some of the things... Some of these changes may be wonderful and long overdue, and some may not be. But either way, such rapid change in all facets of life is disorienting. Where can we find our balance? We find our balance in the faithfulness of God. God is unchanging. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just as his mercy is everlasting, his faithfulness endures from age to age. His faithfulness is not changing. We don't need to wonder if God is somehow less faithful today because of what we are experiencing around us or to us, than, less faithful today than he was for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or to Jesus, for that matter. We are co-heirs with Christ. He is just as faithful to us, and he always will be. That will not change. And so when God says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, God is faithful. When he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, he is faithful. When he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will be with you, God is faithful. Faithful, when he says, whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life, God is faithful. He is good to his word. Whatever's happening in your life, in the world around you, the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. And therefore, therefore now we can... Be joyful in the Lord and serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song and give thanks to him and call upon his name because the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Amen.